so let's start um, this time a formal introduction because last week I didn't do that much. Um, my name is Satish Kays. I head the engineering here in Zotap, and my responsibilities include all the engineering uh, delivery strategy as well as uh, aspects of technical architecture. I come with around 18 years of experience in IT and have been fortunate to spend last eight years in the big data stacks. And I'm passionate about the tech evolution from both business as well as uh, the core tech perspective. Another thing I thought I would mention in this forum is I am also passionate about my art Tai Chi. Okay, that is my LinkedIn profile. And uh, introduction about Zotap. Zotap, we are a Berlin based startup. We started in 2015. 2014 was uh, this thing, but uh, operation started in 2015. And we are a customer intelligence platform which enables brands to better understand their customers. So how we do it is we provide three items. We provide a 360 view of the customer uh, data. We provide identity resolution. And in ad tech, there is a jargon called activation. We also enable activation. So this is a SaaS plus DAS offering. We were originally a data as a service company because we were only dealing with third party data. But given the tech stack we built, we also repurposed it for a SaaS style of offering where brands can directly manage their first party data and optionally use the third party data as well for further enrichments. And every data company has a theme. Uh, we are people centric data collectors and the data can be categorized broadly as the identity data assets and profile data assets. And another style of categorization is deterministic, what actually we collect uh, based on deterministic identifiers. And second thing is, based on our patented algorithms inside the company, we do some inferences and derivations. These we uh, stamp it as probabilistic data, which we supply for our customers as well. And as I told, we are fully privacy and GDPR compliant. Uh, we cater to close to 150 data partners, both inbound ingress as well as egress. Um, currently, the main stacks we are integrated with in any, uh, any company on any layer is the ad tech layer and the martech layer. So that's about Zyota. And GDPR, by now, it is no more tribal knowledge. Uh, given the PDP bill and everything, everybody is having a good level of awareness or a decent level of awareness. But still, I just jotted down a couple of points um, uh, based on our early memories because this is a two-year-old law. It is a EU data protection and privacy bill. It became enforced in May 25th, 2018. And when it came, it had an effect across the whole organization, be it the business teams, the data sourcing team, product and engineering, legal, as well as the security and IT team. Every team had some impact because of this uh, law coming into play in Europe. Couple of broad things it talks about is, one is the personal data. When, I, when we talk about personal data, it means the data collected about any person which is identifiable to him and he is also a EU citizen. So that is called as the personal data. Second thing is the user rights. What are the rights the EU citizen has on the data which is collected by any organization? And what are the access rights? Access rights is both from the user perspective as well as the internal organization perspective. What are the access rights and security controls to be there? And it has some recommendations, broad level recommendations. It doesn't go to saying that this is the encryption algorithm you have to use or this is the technology you have to use, but it broadly recommends how you want to handle your data, how you want to transport your data, how you want to store your data. These kind of recommendations are given. And of course, there are audit requirements. With, with any compliance, any law and any regulation, there are always audit requirements. And the scariest of all, it carried heavy penalties, which could be a make or break for a startup. If you're not compliant, you can as well shut your shop and go away. So that is the kind of penalties it had. And uh, it had two categories of companies which were handling data. And Zotap fell into both categories. We were both a data processor as well as a data controller. We became a data controller because internally we were stitching the device IDs of the person's user with the profile. Uh, it may not be directly stitched together, but we had the inference mechanism. And that is one of our patents, which we had of how the telecom identities are stitched together to the profile of a person. So by that means, we also became a data controller and we had to be compliant on both angles. 
moving on uh, as i told you we took a productish approach so whenever these kind of regulations come in first thing you will get from your uh, security and compliance team is a huge excel sheet which will ask you to categorize all the data assets put everything in picture and all these things don't fall into the trap building a product is much sometimes much faster again than doing this operational exercise and that's exactly what we uh, did in zeotab so when we distilled when we read through the gdpr from the legal lens as well as the business lens and the product lens what we did is we distilled it into a bunch of product requirements and that is what i have listed here so one of the prime requirement of gdpr was how do i handle sensitive data sensitive data means data of a person's ethnicity uh data of his health um his actual pi uh, information which i have categorized as another this thing how do you manage that so these all come under sensitive data management and second thing is it talked about by default it should, the consent is like opt out you have to be explicit about the consent you are collecting it shouldn't be like a implicit consent you take a single con uh, consent for everything and you take it as a user consent instead of that it talked about explicit consent management then the third thing is how do you manage pii's the personally identify information like ip address name email and phone numbers fourth is how do you manage the user information how, what is the product you are going to give out for managing his user information these are a bunch of rights he, he has like rights to be forgotten rights to be erasure rights to portability as well as right to understand what data he has and what are the processing we are doing and access management of course access management i am not going to cover that much in detail in this presentation because uh, this was moved totally to the it and infra folks in terms of uh, putting the access management as per the uh, minimum privileged access policy whatever is applicable then the auditing requirements came in as a product requirements and couple of uh, other remaining requirements are uh, like sometimes very specific to the companies for example zeotap has a use case where we create cohorts from the profile data that is kind of a segmentation or, or audience creation from the data so in this we have some additional requirements to protect ourselves saying that say a cohort should be of minimum 10 10k size beyond that don't export the cohort somewhere outside okay and what are the ttls say for if it's a cookie what is a ttl i'll apply so that i don't have a very stale cookie still in my system and if it's a mid what is a ttl i'll apply so these kind of custom requirements always some companies would be having so that we also had those requirements it also came into the product then of course the pii management and from security perspective they'll say okay if your data is at rest or if you're transporting data to this thing use these levels of security say you need a layer 4 level security you need a transport level security and you also need data encryption if it is encryption this is the standards you used to use so these all kind of rules come from the security teams as well and of course when you are becoming compliant you need to scan through your current existing all data sets so this one time requirement pretty much should be applicable to any company for a one time bootstrap or data clean up as that is asked so that also became as a product requirement uh, which was handled in a uh, pretty much operational manner after this product was built we ran it initially on the all data sets and it, uh, we kind of created the, uh, this thing uh, it it became like a test bed internal test bed if you think about it for us to figure out whether what we have built is working fine or not so moving on uh, if if we kind of split the product into a conceptual model always compliance acts on couple of entities right you have uh, uh, those entities has to be given the first class citizenship in across their architecture and that's exactly what we are at so if you look at it the primary entities are here the user and the data assets themselves and in terms of processing you need some kind of compliance processing which can permeate across all the layers of uh, processing in your system across all your products as well then all these whatever we are talking about in the previous slide right if i want to block a sensitive data i want to validate a sensitive data drop it or if i have to keep a hashing encryption if i have to validate the hash length everything becomes a policy or a rule set so you that becomes another first class entity in your product and another thing based on the previous requirement which is uh, one is the consent if it's opt out you need deletion deletion uh, deletion is not simple in really, really large data sets especially when you are storing across multiple data layers you might have in gcs buckets you might have in bigquery you might have in some other database so the whole deletion processor workflow itself needs a uh, needs a 
focused handling, I would say. Same thing applies to TTL as well. And the top four, which I have uh, mentioned, is the constant audit user as well as the data asset. Okay, so I've just um, layered it as what are the logical entities here, what are the processing entities here, and what is the rule based entities here. So, based on this, we move ahead and started creating the tech architecture for that. The way I'm going to present the tech architecture is uh, more of a bottom up approach. Uh, so, we'll see the various items which we actually put together and finally how they combine to achieve the uh, necessary use cases okay so the first thing okay what you need and without which you should be really fearful to call yourself uh, compliant is a clean data inventory and a data catalog and a lineage system as well lineage is something a bit specific for zeta we had a use case even before compliance to have a lineage i'll just explain it so you need to know who is giving your data, which partner is giving, what is the region it is coming from, what are the categories of data, whether he's giving me only identity information, whether he's giving me apps data, or he's giving me interest-based data, or he's giving me URL browsing data. So all these has to be there, the categorization has to be there. Then you also need to be aware of what this data contains. What is the schema, or registered schema of a data partner? What are the field types, whether it's numeric or text or string, or it is like some regex. Then what is a cardinality? A zip code could be a very high cardinality item, whereas the age could be, uh, can be bucketed and um, created into a five cardinality or four cardinality item, as well as uh, gender could be just three cardinalities, right? And what are the expected values or expected regex and all these things? So this, this is another primary thing you need. And how do you describe the data? Whether it is a raw data set, you have inferred it, it is derived by yourself, if you have derived how it is derived, okay? Then next thing is what is a version? Always uh, when the data is flowing from system to system, right? Downstream system might be acting on a completely different version from what the upstream system is currently handling. So this is something uh, the whole data flow should be aware of. What is the version? Uh, in that time point, what it is acting upon. So the version and timestamp of the data set is very important. Then the last point is talking about the lineage. Uh, why we needed lineages? As I mentioned, we collect data from multiple third-party sources, all right? So suppose there is a user data, his interest data is coming from one data partner, and say his uh, um, income data uh, is coming from another data partner. How do we attribute that? That means I need to know at each attribute level which data partner has contributed to that knowledge of that attribute, right? So this is something which we have and which came in handy when we had to do the opt-out management downstream as well, okay? Then the second thing is, another important thing is resolution of conflict. I can have partner A saying, this uh, particular entity is of age 20, whereas another data partner can say, this particular entity is of age 70, right? 20, is compliant, 17 is a minor, I cannot technically hold the data, so what do I do? So I use this to give benefit of doubt to compliance and say, okay, I won't even process this entity, let me drop the whole record because I'm in doubt. And this has other implications as well, there is a whole layer of data quality and uh, uh, I would say a patented goal set, uh, which kind of helps me in resolving the con conflict, but it is kind of a priority queue. If you look at it, compliance takes the highest priority, then the quality takes the next priority, and so, so on and so forth, okay? So these are a couple of items which we had to build, uh, which some were built and some we were building at that time to achieve this. This is built over RDVMS and Elasticsearch stack, and it has a microservice and library support. Library support is mainly for the Spark uh, processing aspects. You'll see these two points repeating again and again, the microservice and library support. And when the catalog is updated as during the, say, when a data partner comes in, when his data set getting onboarded, as well as during the processing, right? When the data process, uh, process is happening across the layers, you have some updates happening to the catalog as well. Uh, like the classic thing is the data point, the knowledge attribution, which is the outcome of the processing. Now, 
when we were building this, this I'm talking about end 2017 and early 2018, there were no cloud-based native tools or uh, tools like Apache Atlas, uh, which can provide you this capability pretty much out of the box. Now, we are also looking at uh, using any of the specialist tool, the tool set and migrate to it so that the management and uh, downstream involvement is much easier on all these aspects, right? And uh, this has evolved to accommodate more items as well, like the quality stacks and verifications as well. Um, yeah, so this is the first bit of technology in the whole architecture, which was built. Okay, the second entity is the policy management itself. Now the policy is nothing but rule. If uh, say for this data partner, the schema, this is the registered schema. If more schema is coming, raise other. If uh, the email is not coming in hashed format, hash length is less than 42, then it is not a SHA for a SHA hash, drop that record or raise alert to the data sourcing team. So these kind of things. So it, it's a combo of two things. One is the actual rules and another is the actions. Actions, uh, we, we have a out of the box set of actions as well as it is extensible to create custom actions as well. Uh, drop action, alert action, null actions, and all these things. We, I'll just take you through some examples in the next slides to help help understand this. Okay, and this also has a hierarchical support in terms of the policy. If this policy is there, then this also has to be applied. Kind of hierarchical support is also there. And again, it comes with the same kind of tech stack which I told in the previous slide decks. One additional thing is. If you think about it, the policies and actions are not defined by the engineers. It is defined by the domain experts. So we need to give CRUD or create, read, update, and delete via APIs to power users. They could be your uh, legal team, there could be your uh, some uh, account management team, or that could be even your product team. So this is one additional thing over and above the catalog, which is being added. Catalog is more or less, it's like a self input thing. Okay, fine. Just I've just put a sample of a flattened sample of how the policy table is going to look like in the RDBMS. Elasticsearch I couldn't take out because it, it was coming out a bit bigger than what I expected. Okay. Now, next thing you need to understand this concept a bit more. This has two use cases. Okay. One is I am separating the actual runtime parameters for the rules and the thresholds for the rules from the actual rule itself. This gives me, say, tomorrow for CCPA, if I have to change a different set of parameters for the runtime, I can put it against the CCPA loss. Say for PEDP, tomorrow something else is the threshold and runtime parameters, I can change it. So it is in database parlance, this is called the normalization, which helps in more flexibility and evolutionary control as well. So what happens is this is a classic equation. The function of policy plus the function of the parameters which the compliance catalog provides gives you the action. So let's take two actions, for example. Suppose say the policy is a schema policy and it is talking about age and the parameter age threshold is 18 and the action executed is drop the record, drop action is executed. There is another policy saying that device IP address policy if it is present in this data partner, that is a parameter. If it is, if it is present, it's just a Boolean parameter. It is present or absent. Present means replace it with null. You take the null action on top of it. Another major uh, flexibility which we had because of separating this catalog is the data layer pretty much has many encoded parameters. When I say encoded parameters, the interest, for example, since we are in uh, capturing to ad tech and many ad tech data partners are there for us, they give interest in the IAB style uh, coding, which is IAB underscore one, IAB underscore two, IAB underscore three. Like this, you could have custom jargons coming into your data platform, but that may not make sense for your backend as well as the Unity user team. So you need to have some translation. So this catalog, helps, uh, though I have named it as a compliance catalog, it is a little broader than the compliance catalog. So it has this blacklist, whitelist, and all these translations so that the backend and UI can consume it as well. Yeah, makes sense. So these two slides, from these three slides, let's see how a Spark processing pipeline is going to work like. Now, if you look at it, whatever I talked about till these three slides, they all fall under in some way your data governance layer. Uh, I have a couple of other services which I have put here. Uh, I'll just 
take a couple of seconds to explain that config service is nothing but the actual spark job properties and spark config itself because for each of the workflow each of the item which is being processed it needs a separate set of properties those all are maintained by the config service and the data catalog we, we just talked about then the policy store we just talked about and path catalog is something interesting this is for our trigger based mechanisms so we uh, um, just to give you the problem statement there um, all my data partners they just put data into various gct paths G gcs paths okay the, the cloud buckets and this path catalog is actually tracking them and it helps us in triggering the workflow at the right times so and once that workflow is triggered it also knows next workflow has been triggered and registered as a path which is available so it, it is kind of a metadata on the pipeline itself so that is a path catalog then last one is the compliance catalog which we again talked about what is happening here say you have a data partner you have a data set of the data partner coming in first using the uh, governance mechanism it will figure out what are the schema level policy it will do the processing it will take the actions and write the relevant audit logs then it will go into a loop where it will look into the value level policies value level policies if you think about it it has to be applied on record level or the row level so for each record it will look at the value level policies and take the actions after that is done you get a compliant data set okay so this is how these three all these three together is getting actuated into an actual workflow so like this we have multiple pipelines but what I'm trying to say is I'm just saying the sample of how one Spark process is going to work here. Okay, next comes the privacy opt-out and consent. So opt-out means the user is saying, just take me out of your system. And uh, there are nuanced opt-out as well as nuanced consent. You can opt-out and there is something called what are the purpose you're opting out from. It could be a blanket opt-out or a purpose level opt-out. Same applies for giving consent as well. Blanket consent is given or purpose-driven consent is given. Zero tap has three modes of collecting consent. Given we are a data controller as well, we are obliged to create a privacy website as well as an app. So that is what I have mentioned as the zero tap consent that flows into my API, into my backend system and comes into the pipelines. Second is the data partner. When I say partner, who's giving me data into the system? Now, this is again a multifold mechanism because uh, some data partner gives us a cloud uh, transfer, some gives us a SFTP. So it is similar to ingestion, how I get my opt-out and the consent data. Also, there is a HTTP real-time API where they hit when they are doing some syncing stuff as well. Okay, So all these uh, mechanisms are available for the partner as well as the consumers. And based on how my consent is coming into the system, I have three modes of handling within this. So if it is zero tap, it is always global because that is that is directly coming to you as uh, the user is saying, opt me out of your system, opt me out of zero tap. That means I have to go and nuke this guy or nuke this entity across my data sets. And also wherever I have given downstream, I have to notify them to take him out of their systems as well because I have given the data point. Whereas when it comes to the data partner level, if you remember, I talked about the lineage and all these things, what I'll do is I'll only nuke the knowledge which the data partner has specifically given me, be it the identities. If he has given me email and some profile data, I'll take off those email and those data sets. If he has given me email and a couple of other identifiers and a couple of uh, identifiers alone, I just take all those from my system. Okay. The third is the consumer level. Consumer level is even more interesting. When I say consumer, consumer is our channel partners. It could be Google, Facebook, Instagram, and all these fellows. So once the user opt-outs of Google, Google comes and tells me this guy has opt-outed out of my system. When I am sending this process data to him, right? At that time, I have to filter him out. See, this user still I can send to the other channels because he has an opted out out of the other channels but he has opted out of Google. So I have to filter it from the Google system alone. So this is why I put, we have three kinds of handling, the global partner level and consumer level. And uh, that is all again run by a various process. It's, it's very difficult to put all the process slides here. So I'm just giving you a verbal explanation. Hope, hope that is uh, explaining things. If you have any doubts, ask me uh, after the session, okay. And 
what happens is from this constant you i'll show you in the next slide there is a constant object which is uh, constructed which has the identities on which the constant has to be applied and what is the purpose of the constant and the latest development in uh, the past one year has been we also became the tcf compliant tcf is a transparency and consent framework which came from something called the international advertising bureau consortium uh, which helps in managing uh, consent at a blanket level across the cookies and the maids mobile identifiers because that is the identities primarily zootap works on it is the browser cookies and the mobile identifiers next so this is how the consent pipeline looks like uh, as i told i am getting from data partner a probably the second thing i should have given as a, a data consumer b and zootap and what is meant by this id enrich is uh, see if zootap is giving right zootap we can get consent from a email id or i can get from a cookie or i can get from a maid so since i have to do a blanket nuke what i have to do is i have to figure out what all the other ids that is linked to this particular email id first thing is i have to hash the email id because he is sending me an email to privacy.zootap.com i have to convert to hash then based on the hash i have to enrich all the identifiers which are linked to the hash then i convert everything to the standard format and same applies for data partner what happens is uh, if he gives id i have to figure out what are all the ids which is coming to the data partner which the data partner has given me in the past and i have to link them all together and create the consent object and the consent tags tags is nothing but the purposes which you are talking about so you have a yes no and if it's yes no what are the purposes and currently for uh, no we are not supporting uh, granular purposes for a no we just go ahead and uh, nuke it because uh, um, yeah we just go and nuke it we are not doing any further processing there so that is why i mentioned as a deletion is one of the activity and another is for the processing whether it can be allowed to processing or not is given by the consent processor liberty as a boolean for any of the downstream processing okay so this is about the consent data flow um a, a sample data flow of how the consent looks like it's not a sample actually this is how the production also looks like more or less next comes the user management as i told since we are a controller this privacy website and privacy app how we are managing right so the primary key here as i have been alluding to in the in the past 15 20 minutes is like mainly the maids ma by maids what i mean is the mobile advertising ids which is the idfa for apple and uh, advertisement ad id for uh, google then you have the cookies browser based cookies you have the email hash you have the phone hash these are the four key or four identifiers which zootap collect we don't collect ip address as of today we don't collect actual names of the person we don't collect ssn and other things so these are all couple of things in our blacklist which we don't collect for zootap these are the identifiers we work with and uh, we had to create a app we have to create a mobile app and the website and they interact to the uh, api the backend api which is based out of uh, java play framework is something like a drop wizard and all these frameworks and given the size of our data set we heavily use blooms so that the identifiers are quickly checked whether it is present or not present and all the identifiers are currently stored in a db called aerospike which is a i would say a fast Uh, transactional oltp transactional read write database so that is being used for all my identifiers for this particular purpose as well okay okay the next item we covered bunch of the items in the product slide which i showed as well as the requirements slides next is which is again very important is audit so the audit we division we took it is we'll take the logging itself as the audit and we take all the logs and store it in uh, buckets so that it can be loaded to uh, olap database of your choice it could be redshift or bigquery or snowflake or plain hive and presto and you do your analytics and analysis but only key there is we didn't want to make an unstructured log we wanted a common log across the organization especially for the gdpr compliance so we abstracted it out with a compliance logger the library as well as a microservice what happens is the log grammar includes the items which i have listed there the violation type which product is uh, giving me that log what is the data flow stage what is the action taken what is the time stamp of the action when it was taken what is the time stamp when the violation actually occurred and couple of other metadata around the log as well right 
So this service is pretty much used across our layers so that uh, across Spark as well as the backend layers and we aggregate the log into a single place and it is stored on, I don't remember the bucket, uh, I think it's month-wise bucket because compliance logger is not that heavy compared to say application log. Uh, so currently if I remember it is month-wise buckets and this can be load and you can analyze what all has actions happened and what has uh, how many concerns has come in and all these kind of things. You can do some basic analysis and forecast. Yeah. Okay, putting it all together. So as I told, compliance is a first class citizen. This is a complete cons uh, compliance service. It provides uh, capabilities over the blacklist management, sensitive data management, the user data services, audit management, uh, the compliance workflow is what is triggering those Spark workflows and uh, determines which layer has to apply what policies and rule sets. And these are my ingestion pipelines on the left-hand side. And these are the egress pipelines. Um, this is the only slide I had before, so <laughs> which I used to showcase to say our uh, outside deck. So I just reused that. And it's a pretty old slide. I didn't rework on it. And if you look at it on the top layer is the actual apps, which ZeroTap provides for the opt-out. And there is a user and the consent API layer, user API layer. And this admin layer is what I talked about for the policies and the catalog management. Uh, which is not exposed to this web app. So this is this admin layer is actually used only by the power users for the API based users. And uh, it's just a representative from the various stores which we talked about till now uh, to achieve this, um, the whole use cases, right? So this is how, if you look at it from a 50,000 feet view, how the architecture is going to look like for this, the whole product. Uh, next is uh, any architecture, you will have a couple of uh, requirements, non-functional requirements like how it scales, uh, how resilient it is, is it extensible and all these things. So this is from our own experience. When we deployed this uh, particular system in place, we had close to 80 workflows. And now we have more than 400 workflows and we are still scaling on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, all workflows has a certain set of process of how this has to be, how this is initiated in the Spark library and how it takes care of the things, right? Second thing is we also did a AWS to GCP migration and it, it, it was a decent, fairly simple lift and shift for us, this whole compliance angle as well, this process as well. Then second is when CCPA came into play, uh, we had to, we could uh, tweak the policies accordingly for the US and uh, specifically to the CA, California region, to make it extensible and accommodate those aspects as well. Of course, there were some changes. I don't remember everything off my head. But uh, as far as I remember, we could accommodate everything without engineering effort. Just with the testing and sanity effort, we were able to cover that. Um, so this is uh, largely the pipeline summary uh, of how the things have been deployed. Next item is infra and security validations. Uh, I thought I'll briefly touch upon this. Uh, ZeroTap, all the infra is split region-wide. We are very, very careful about data sovereignty. Whatever data is in EU, it is always in EU. Data storage as well as processing. Same applies for US and same applies for India as well. And the access rights controls, we have a couple of certifications which I'll touch upon. So it's, as I mentioned in the talk before, it is based on minimum privileged access across all the data sets. And we have a chief data officer as well as a security person who does a quarterly audit on this and figures out if there are any exceptions and passes on recommendations, which is taken up by the infra team. Then we don't mix the ID and profile except during runtime processing. Always the ID uh, and the profile is pseudonymized in the sense during ingestion itself, if I get an email ID or a cookie ID, what happens is a pseudonymized ID, which we internally call it, call as a ZU ID or a ZeroTap unique ID is identified for each of the user profile entity. And at any point in time, if you want to do analysis of say general age bucket analysis or general interest bucket analysis or how much of the fill rate I have, you operate on this identifier, which doesn't give the actual identifier of these sets. That is happening only during for the, that access is allowed only for the runtime applications. 
then another security recommendation is the data at rest uh, encryption pretty much all the data at rest be it in gcs buckets or anything it's 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 uh, encrypted we also use bigquery which is again encrypted data, data at rest and the uh, email and phone numbers uh, we hash this has some nuances in the sense we support all three hashes if a uh, data partner says i can use all three hashes we go ahead and use md5 sha sha256 as well applied for phone number and we use uh, uppercase lowercase and ignore case so in all this hash combination itself is like a 9 plus 6 15 total combinations are available in our systems uh, it may not be always the same fill rate because of uh, the contracts we enter into the data partner um, so these all couple of other items I thought would be useful for this forum. So I presented this um, as well. <clears throat> and the hash all are validated. We have uh, every hash has a length parameter, so you can easily validate as well as the email and phone number. There are um, regexes against which you can validate. So these are all uh, IDs which you can validate unless, unlike a cookie, which can be any random UUID, right? So whereas these identifiers, which are PIAs, you have some levels of validations as well on top of it. GDPR doesn't recommend any certification um, out of the box, but if you have all these certifications, it um, kind of enhances your stance in saying that, okay, uh, we can believe this company is compliant. So we have gone through ISA 2000, um, 27,001 certification for past three years. We did a recertification this year as well. And same applies for the CSA star certificate from BSI. I don't remember the, this thing. It's some British standard institute or whatever. Then the e-privacy seal from the, I think it is from the EU forum, one of the forum, we also have that. Um, I don't know what will be applicable for the PDP down the line, if there is going to be some other ISO stack or whatever. Uh, but yeah, given all the stacks we have built, uh, we are very confident that we could just uh, swim the PDP bill through as well. And current additional developments which are happening is, if you look at it, when I was going through the slides, there were a couple of manual processes which can induce human errors, like when the data partner is onboarded, there could be some manual errors in terms of saying the schema has so and so items, whereas the additional item comes in. Of course, there are some validations present there, but still there are human errors which can creep in. Uh, what we are looking at is uh, current development is going on around uh, NLP, AML based uh, scanning of the data sets and application. Of course, there are major cost challenges of productionizing this as well. Uh, but this is some active development which is going on um, in terms of uh, both for the data quality as well as the compliance aspects. Um, this is the current development which is happening in the organization across the data layers. And uh, yeah, that ends my slide show. We can move on to the question and answer sessions. Hopefully there were some useful pointers for everybody. Thank you. Um, uh, Satish, same question to you. Has there been any update uh, over the past year and uh, anything you'd like to say to uh, companies that are trying to comply with uh, the upcoming data protection bill in India? Hey, uh, Anvisha, thank you. Um, so one of the changes which has happened in the architecture or which, is, uh, which has gone into production, if you look at it in the whole talk, uh, it was mainly heuristic based and I had put a comment about uh, ML based approach. Um, so what we have built uh, uh, on top of this is something called the privacy enhancing techniques, uh, which helps between any data transfer between point A and point B. So that is one additional thing. And of course, the other additional thing is the certifications have gone up a lot. Uh, beyond ISO, you have the SOC 2 and all these additional certifications which you have done. Uh, specifically with respect to PDP, nothing uh, has been done because I'm also waiting for the law to be passed. We have the draft of the bill. And once the law is passed, we don't see any major challenges at this point in time to be changed. Uh, but the privacy enhancing technique is mainly for a bunch of business use cases where uh, the value exchange can be done between two uh, different teams, right, in, in the customer's end. So that, that was one of the cases. Uh, probably what is the technique and other things is beyond the scope at this point in time, but uh, we could talk about it later.